Oh yeah, you guys thought I wasn't going to talk about this shit. Well, buckle up. Devil's Advocate is back. Hey guys, Trip here. A lot of you may find the title of this episode a bit hyperbolic. If that's the case, well, I can't really blame you, but it's how I feel right now. There's a few things in this industry that really set me off. We're going to be talking about most of them today, so don't be surprised if I get a little angrier than you're used to. We're also going to get into some arcane legal theory. I did my best reading case studies and talking to some lawyer friends, but I'm generally the last person you want to come to for legal advice, so take that stuff with a grain of salt. So with that out of the way, you may be wondering what the hell this episode is about. Well, consider the following a chronicle of the ineptitude, paranoia, greed, and slow self-destruction of two publishers, intent on eroding whatever goodwill they had left with their consumers. Take Two and Topware, two companies I never thought I'd mention in the same sentence, seem to have angered the entire gaming community with their latest actions. To be fair, the community always seems angry about something, but this time the vitriol feels earned. So what did Take Two and Topware do to get people so angry? Is the internet overreacting, or is this a serious issue? What does this mean for the industry as a whole? Well, let's take a look. Put simply, two separate publishing companies within the span of a week made their games less fun to play. Games we already bought and paid for. To better understand this, we need to understand two hallmarks of PC gaming. The console and modifications. If you're a gamer, you may already know what this stuff means, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page so no one can defend this bullshit. I'll leave a timestamp in the description if you want to skip ahead. When PC gamers refer to the console, they're talking about development tools left in the game for us to play with. They're normally used by the developers for testing reasons, but in the hands of players they are more or less cheats. In Bethesda games, for example, players can use the console to spawn any item in the game, teleport themselves anywhere, even allow them to change their appearance on the fly. They're absolutely essential in games that have a lot of bugs, as clever use of the console can fix a lot of problems that would otherwise force a player to restart the entire game. A mod is a catch-all term for files that alter your game. For decades, players have used mods to create new items, stories, or even expansion-sized worlds to explore. People make these mods for fun, practice, or just to personalize their games. Mods are, with very few exceptions, required to be free of charge. As long as you bought the original game, you can download any mod you want. Entire websites are dedicated to archiving these mods, ensuring they're free of viruses and easily downloadable. As a result, mods can cause entire communities to develop, keeping a game alive long after it's been released. Take-Two and Topware don't give a shit about any of this. First came Take-Two, who decided to send a cease and desist to Open4, a modding tool for Grand Theft Auto V. Open4, as the name suggests, has been around since GTA 4, and helped people create the wacky, creative, often bizarre mods that kept the game on people's minds for years. It's no secret that GTA 5's multiplayer is poorly designed and riddled with hackers. Rather than fixing their own servers or going after the hackers, Take-Two decided to target a seemingly unrelated party, the people that create mods for the single-player version of the game. The publisher laid out their reasoning in a rambling, typo-ridden mess allegedly written by company lawyers. Put simply, they believe mod making is illegal. It doesn't matter if you're using them to gain an unfair advantage in multiplayer, or if you're just tinkering with your own game in the single-player mode. Take-Two wants to control how you play your games. Given their alleged harassment of modders, which includes sending private detectives to their homes, it's clear they mean business. As if that weren't enough to send the community into an uproar, Topware, a moderately obscure company known for its charming, if mediocre, games, decided to update Two Worlds 2, an RPG released in late 2010. This game was never particularly popular, but many enjoyed it despite its flaws. Topware itself had a reputation of being a spunky underdog, doing their best to make decent games. So what did they decide to add to such an old game like Two Worlds 2? Microtransactions They added microtransactions to a six-year-old single-player RPG. 
Now, follow me here, because the more I explain this, the dumber it gets. Asking people to spend more money on a game they already paid for is one thing, but they're selling us items that already exist in the game. Now, encouraging players to buy items instead of earning them is nothing new. Unfortunately, this is slowly becoming standard practice in the industry. But there's a sadistic twist to what Topware did here. You see, everything Topware is selling us can easily be spawned through the console. If you want more gold or a special weapon, just press a few buttons and there it is. So, seeing as there's literally no reason for anyone to actually buy these microtransactions, Take Two decided to shut off the console commands. Yes, after six years on the market, Topware decided to remove a feature from the game, only to sell it back to you. If you own Two Worlds 2, it's likely been updated already. Let me make something clear. In my mind, access to the console is a feature. Modability is a feature. At the end of the day, your games now have less features than they did when you bought them. Mods and console commands are staples of PC gaming. For some, it's the main reason they play on the PC, so they can take their own games and alter them as they see fit. But we don't own our games anymore. Take a look at your game cabinet or your Steam library. None of that is your property. Sure, you could argue that we haven't owned our games in years, that the games as a service scam has eroded any lingering sense of ownership. On top of that, most products you own come with strings attached. You can't copy and resell movies, for example. These are reasonable restrictions backed by decades of legal precedence. But beyond these basic guidelines, there's always been a tacit agreement between gamers and publishers. We'll buy your overpriced, overproduced, underdeveloped games instead of pirating them, and you'll let us do what the fuck we want with them. Sure, there's slip-ups on both sides, but this uneasy truce has stood fast and true for the past 10 or so years. But a line was crossed last month. Not only are publishers restricting what we do with our games, but they're taking away features we had when we bought them. In the case of Topware, they took features away to resell them to us. In what world is that okay? Let's focus on the mod aspect for a second, because I think it's especially important to understand why Take-Two's behavior is moronic. Not only are mods a long-standing and beloved facet of PC gaming, but they've proven to be extremely beneficial to developers as well. Since the days of Wolfenstein, players have created their own levels, weapons, enemies, and even total conversions, entirely new games built on the bones of another. Mods keep games relevant, providing free marketing for the publishers. Mods allow hobbyists and freelancers to experiment and to practice. Some of the most groundbreaking innovations in the industry began as mods. A little game called Defense of the Ancients began as a mod for Warcraft 3. You may have heard of it. Mods can be a source of inspiration for the original developers. It's an open secret that one of the most popular mods for Skyrim inspired the Hearthfire DLC, allowing you to build your own home. Speaking of Skyrim, how popular would Bethesda games be if not for the modding community? Sure, plenty of people play the games without mods, but what keeps people talking about them? What's keeping them relevant? One glance at YouTube or a gaming forum will quickly answer your question. There are new mods for Skyrim almost every day, which means more YouTube videos showcasing them, which means more references to Skyrim on Google. Quite simply, mods are keeping Skyrim in the zeitgeist, whether you use them or not. Not only that, but modders have been fixing Bethesda's notoriously buggy games for years. One look at the unofficial Skyrim patch will let you know just how beneficial mods are to the developers. Wait, what the hell am I doing? I could go on for ages about how mods are integral to the success and longevity of video games and how beneficial they can be for publishers, but quite frankly, none of this matters to me as a consumer. I shouldn't have to justify my right to alter my own games. For whatever reason, be it paranoia, incompetence, or a pathological need for possession and control, Take-Two and Topware are content to sabotage their goodwill, and eventually, possibly, their profits. It's worth noting that most publishers understand this. In fact, Take-Two and Topware are in the minority here. 
A growing number of publishers are embracing mods, acknowledging the good they do for their business and the goodwill they get from consumers. Meanwhile, Take-Two and Topware have gone off the deep end, taking the industry's out-of-touch practices to a new low. Even Rockstar, Take-Two's subsidiary and the creator of GTA V, has issued a statement that they approve of single-player mods and has convinced Take-Two to back off for now. Still, it's unclear how long this piece will last. Take-Two itself has not signaled any policy change. They're still retaining the right to act like idiots in the future. Either way, these actions represent growing, widespread problems within the industry. There is a total lack of respect for the consumer and a steady erosion of our perceived rights. As long as publishers can get away with these practices, they're not going to stop. Even if Topware and Take-Two are in the minority, we still need to call out these issues before they spread. So, in the midst of all this anger and vitriol, you may be wondering, is any of this even legal? Well, that's a question without an obvious answer. On paper, it seems simple. A company shouldn't be able to take away features after you bought the product. Nor should a company dictate what you do with the product so long as you're not reselling it. However, thanks to those giant walls of text known as terms of service, it's really not that simple. We sign away a lot of those rights in order to play our games, and we have little choice in the matter. It's pretty common for these terms to include clauses that relinquish our ownership of a product, allow the publisher to alter the product at any time, and even preclude us from suing them for any reason. At the same time, many of these terms are legally shaky or unenforceable, especially in countries where consumer protections are strong. So, do we actually need to abide by the publishers, or are they in the wrong? Well, after talking to some of my lawyer friends, reading case studies, and generally trying to wrap my brain around the chaos of consumer protection laws in the digital age, it's really hard to say. The fact that gaming is an international market further complicates the situation. In the European Union, for example, courts often side with the consumer, citing unfair contract terms. These laws are much looser in the US, however, because consumer rights are much weaker here. That being said, even US courts will step in if a company egregiously abuses its power. Because the law is such a mess right now, no one really wants to touch it. No one wants to risk setting a legal precedent that's not in their favor, and in most cases, these issues are resolved outside of court. Once a strong precedent is set, the battle is pretty much over. If the law sides with publishers, they have free reign to do pretty much whatever they want to us. If the law sides with us, the industry will need to drastically change. As of now, both sides can claim the other is wrong and threaten each other without the risk of court. This is most commonly seen on YouTube, where publishers are constantly trying to stifle critical videos, but rarely if ever does it end up in court. Legal chaos aside, what do we actually have to lose by defying these companies? At the end of the day, what's actually stopping us from hacking into Two Worlds 2 and re-enabling the console? Is Take-Two honestly willing to send every modder to court in different countries with different laws, wasting money and public opinion on cases that they may not even win? Clearly they're willing to threaten the bigger fish, but can they really stop all the mods that are floating around? Either way, there comes a point where we as consumers need to ask ourselves, how much more are we willing to take? Whenever something like this happens, it's easy to fall into nihilism. Time and again, gamers have accepted these practices with a shrug and a sigh. After all, what else can we do? Those who care about this stuff tend to think they're in the minority. Regardless of their actions, millions of people will blindly buy games from these companies, so what's the point of resisting? Indeed, recent history has taught us that the industry will continue to exploit us with little consequence. But if history has taught us anything, it's that businesses can only push consumers so far before they lose interest. We see this happen all the time. Hollywood is terrified that people aren't watching their reboots anymore. The cable companies feel threatened as people switch to online media. Hell, the entire video game industry crashed in the 80s due to poor quality and market saturation. Consumers have more power than they think. So yes, things are probably going to get worse before they get better. But the silver lining here is that the industry can't sustain itself like this. 
Games are getting more expensive. Companies are getting more open and daring and extreme in their abuse. We've reached a point where every big budget game can decimate a company if it doesn't make massive profits. These bloated budgets necessitate the predatory behavior seen by Take-Two, Topware, and countless others, and consumers have come to expect huge, complex games as compensation. It's a vicious circle, and at some point, something's going to snap. So why did I decide to talk about this? Because we can't keep letting this shit go. We can't keep assuming we're powerless. Make no mistake, Take-Two isn't done screwing with us, and someone else will replace Topware once they fall into obscurity. The industry has made it abundantly clear that they're willing to do whatever they can get away with. This is an industry that compares consumers to animals based on how much they spend. They have no respect for you. The only thing they care about is your wallet, and they become paranoid, irrational, and bitter at the thought of losing it. As the industry reaches a breaking point, as budgets get larger and publishers more desperate, I suspect we're going to see more of this behavior in the future. So you're right to be cynical. A nerd yelling on the internet won't change the industry overnight, but continued financial and PR pressure does make a difference. Take Two wouldn't have backed off if not for the massive consumer backlash it received. Topware already lost its fan base due to a series of poorly received games that no one bought. And even if our voices don't matter, it's only a matter of time before the casual gamer gets sick of the market and withdraws altogether. This industry is going to change one way or another. I've been accused of having a burn it all down mentality, but maybe that's the only thing that will get this industry back on track. Maybe these are necessary growing pains in an evolving market. Maybe the industry needs to fail. Perhaps it needs to see that its path is unsustainable before it can improve. But hey, that's just my opinion. Hey guys, Trip here. If you liked that video, why not watch some more? Hit that like button and make sure to share this video on Reddit and social media. If you want to see more Psycho Trip, check out my Patreon. There you'll find all of my videos as well as articles I've written for Comicsverse. If you like what you see, think about donating a dollar or two. If you're wondering why this episode took so long to make, my apartment shut off my internet for a while. So yeah, Patreon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.